Welcome back today, Red Coat. Forlorn Hope just released a new single, it's called Red Coat, and it is a, well, it's a song about the Red Coats, the British uh, infantry. Although it's perfectly, it's, it's almost tailor-made for what I'm doing here, because it's basically just a couple of one-liners about a lot of interesting things they did during the past, which is exactly what I want to talk about. So let's give it a listen. Uh, as per normal, I'll be pausing and, and that sort of thing. So. It's the uh, Waterloo uniform. There's some... Uh, the Slope Wolf. He's uh, climbing at, at near Quebec. It took me a while to figure out what that was actually talking about. I mean, it's quite obvious that it's Waterloo, so that's that's obviously Waterloo. Um, but Waterloo isn't in Flanders, which sort of threw me off. But the British have a habit of just saying that that whole part of the world is technically Flanders. Um, uh, Flanders is in Belgium, which is a fiction the British made up after, basically. Well, the, anyway, Belgium isn't real. <laughs> Belgium is named after an ancient tribe that sees a fort called the Belge. But that part of the world is really... Um, Flems and Walloons, so Flanders and, and Wallonia or something like that. But it's two very distinct groups of people who, who even today are very, uh, I don't think they intermarry very much. So it's, it's very distinct groups of Flems and Walloons in different parts of the world. But anyway, Waterloo is obviously very famous and does not me, need me to do a breakdown because I've already done it, um, of the movie at least. It's a famous breakthrough at, uh, So, Bunker Hill, very famous action at the very beginning of the American Revolution. Uh, Boston is is rebelling. Uh, the colony of Massachusetts is beginning the rebellion. And about 1,200 militia, Minutemen, general, you know, uh, American colonials uh, occupy Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill. Breed's Hill is actually where everything really happens. That's the big, most of the fighting happens at Breed's Hill. But Bunker Hill has just become the the uh the name of what happened there so it's 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 one of those things that just history is a little weird sometimes um the british having these americans surrounding them uh, kind of had to do well at that time they wouldn't have, you know they had these these forces surrounding these rebels so they they attacked uh and they attacked three times were thrown back twice and made the third time uh they made it into the the lines of bunker at Breed's Hill and basically killed a bunch of people and won the battle. But the Americans took a lot of heart from this because they stood up to three full charges from British Redcoats, which was, you know, it's kind of impressive. Was very famous home. Was to do and die. Very famous. Hero of his country. Interesting. I like that. Um, I really like the way they do the chorus because I think it's it's really really uh, true to history. And a vagabond Hero and a vagabond. It's uh, it reminds me of Wellington's um, Wellington's quote that always gets sort of messed with, but it goes something along the lines of "scum of the earth, but we make them heroes." Um, the British Army was not the place for. Um, well, it was a place where the gentlemen and the people who would have been in prison or who had just got out of prison and had nowhere else to go went. It was uh, somewhere you went to see the world and make a fortune or you've just lost your job and you have nothing else. Like it's a, it's a collection of all these different people and a lot of them aren't very nice. <laughs> but at the same time, they're also keeping the French away from the, the country. They're also um, saving Spain when Napoleon takes it over. They're also conquering all of Canadian North America for the British, except for Quebec or something. They're taking all this stuff. They're also the people who are garrisoning the towns in India to stop the, uh, the local bad mashers and, and various rulers from killing people. <laughs> then they're also the ones killing people. It's a very interesting um, 
dichotomy and it's really good that they've kept the hero but they're also not the nicest people in the world Remember, for the majority of the world, the red turn is an oppressive force. Yes, the, the, it's very interesting that for queen and, and king and country, of course, um, you've got people like Queen Anne, Queen, queen Victoria at this time. Um, is for Georgia, sorry. Um, so, you know, queen and, and king and country and all that sort of positive stuff. And then you've got gold and fame, because, of course... Um, Looting was pretty widespread. Uh, we all know what happened after Badahoff, which we'll talk about later, but the, th the multiple days of looting and pillaging of that city, uh, uh, town. Um, you could get rich <laughs> in the Redcoats. Uh, most of the time you'd spend it on drink and other things, but you could still get rich. Uh, I'm thinking of the siege of the, the, the destruction of the Summer Palace in China. Um, where they just went in and took whatever they wanted uh, and then burned it down because um, they wanted to punish the nobility but not the people of China. And you know, it, it was quite an interesting siege, but an interesting um, event. Uh, there's other things we can talk about, but let's not. There's the hook. There's some Highlanders there. Culloden, Culloden Moor, or Culloden, Culloden Moor. That is the one of the last battles of the Jacobite 45, which was the last Jacobite rising. Um, and I've got a particular connection because I'm a Cameron, very slightly <laughs> a Cameron, and the Camerons were the ones who basically kicked that whole thing off. Uh, don't have 40 minutes to go into the Jacobite risings, but essentially um, the king is a Catholic and that is not allowed. So he is exiled, um, this is back in the 1600s, comes back with an army, is defeated, um, and the two Jacobite Risings are 15 and 45. So the Jacobite Rising of 15 comes along, um, some stuff happens, but the 45 is what the Culloden is the culmination of. Uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie, as he became known, lands, and the clans, the Highland clans, really don't rally to him. Uh, only one clan actually does, the Camerons, under Lochiel, which was the head of the Camerons, it's always called Lochiel, and part of the reason they did that was because one of Lochiel's close family members had actually became a Catholic priest, and had spent, it was obviously that was a kind of a big part of this whole restoration of the monarchy, uh, a lot of, but basically most Catholics in, in or that were left in the United Kingdom supported the restoration of the monarchy, um, the Campbells were still sort of Catholic. They had about it's normally split in thirds between Methodist, Catholic, and non-juring Anglican, which is basically just Anglicans, but they don't like the king, which is strange. But anyway, um, so the the forty-five starts. They get quite successful. They actually go quite far south. Um, the British, who at the time um, pull their armies out of Europe, where they're fighting in the War of Austrian Succession. Um, again, it's, it's a mess. Uh, they pull some armies out of Europe to fight and eventually come up with Culloden, um, which is one of the last battles in the north up in Scotland. Uh, it's the last battle on British soil, technically. Um, technically, you could find some other thing where like a parachutist landed in World War II secretly and had a gunfight or something, but this is the last actual battle on British soil. Um, it's the beginning of the new model bayonet drill, I believe. Um, or at least it's the first time the British had put in an interesting bayonet drill into practice. Uh, I don't particularly put much faith in that. Um, basically, the whole thing was sort of like a hoplite style. You fight the man next to you. Let's, uh, yeah, I think I would cast a bit of doubt on how effective that was. But anyway. Yeah, the British one. Survivor of horror with a hardened heart Rebels left to the camp Oh, 
oh, I was blown away. This is my, one of my favorite ones of the whole thing. This is about the Indian mutiny. Jeez, survivors lashed to the cannon and blown apart because what they did with mutineers was they would blow them from guns, which meant they would tie you either frontwards or backwards, I don't know which would be worse, to a cannon, um, which either had powder and a little bit of like a stone ball in it and some powder or something, or just powder, and then touch it off and then explode you with a cannon. Um, nasty, nasty practice. This Indian mutiny is probably one of the most disgusting things <laughs> that you can research. Um, essentially, the <laughs> this one I will go into a little bit. So the lie, it's not a lie originally. Originally, the British government sends cartridges greased with pig and cow fat um, for the new rifle. Uh, but as soon as it gets to India, or as soon as the people in India hear about it, as soon as the British top brass in India hear about it, they instantly refuse to take take possession of it. They instantly refuse it. And they say, we cannot give these to troops because they won't use it. Because of, uh, Muslim and Hindu troops will not have pig and cow fat. So they instantly come up with a solution using vegetable oil and it's, it's solved. Um, people back in Britain didn't understand the situation in India. The British in India understood it very well. That's it. However, however, the fact that it was changed was became the point of contention in that the Indians didn't really believe it. Um, there's talk of the Russians influencing this because, of course, this is the great game, which is basically the fight between Britain and Russia, especially when it regards India of this t uh, time period. But anyway, the Indians did not um, trust the British to give them cartridges that they thought would break their caste. So to the Hindus, I think it goes something like, if they had done this, they would have had cow fat on them at some point, or they would have eaten it at some point, which would break their caste. And the, the, the story went that they were trying to break everybody's caste so that they would no longer have any uh, pride or status. To someone who's more of an expert can go into that. And the uprising, there's a few different places, but the real, uh, the real place it began was Meirut. And in Meirut, they massacred the, the uh, white population, basically killed uh, women, children, all the men, obviously. Uh, people ripped apart, tortured, brutally, violently killed. Um, and then from there, they went on, and parts of India started erupting. Um, the majority of the Indians did not side with the mutineers. The majority of them sided with the British, obviously, because the British won in... This is uh, 1857, and it's over in 1858, so it's only a, a one- or two-year thing. The majority of people did side with the, the British. or At that, that time, the, East in, uh, the British East India Company... Uh, the British East India Company would actually be abolished after 1858, and it became part of the empire. It just became directly ruled. And you always hear of this supposed prophecy that um, the British would be, the Sirka would be destroyed a hundred years after it started. The Sirka is the East India Company. And technically that's true in that it, it didn't last beyond 1858, but it was replaced with the actual British rule. So blood-soaked land, um, everywhere that there were these uprisings, there were massacres. Uh, not just of of military people, but of their families, of um, civ civil people who are not Indian or were the wrong kind of Indian. Remember, of course, that this is India; it doesn't really exist. It's a patchwork of little of little rajas and and different kingdoms everywhere. And so, if you're from somebody that somewhere that they don't like, or you're uh, half Indian or Anglo Indian or French Indian or something like that, yeah, you you got massacred. Um, the British struggled to get forces together to reply because, of course, a lot of their forces got destroyed in these uprisings. Um, this is where you get people like the Rani of Jhansi, uh, becomes a big hero in this when she sides with the mutineers. Uh, she ends up getting killed. They made a movie about it, I think. Haven't seen it. Don't know if it's any good. Probably not. Um, because they're probably very sympathetic to her when you really shouldn't be. Um, it's one of those things where the uprising starts with all these brutal, violent uh, uh, massacres. And at one point, there is a, a massacre of women and children who are thrown into a well and just left in, left there to just rot. Um, there are a, a corn pour is one of the big sieges in this. 
there's a bunch of sieges where the British basically have to hold out. Uh, at one point, the British are holding out and they get given a peace peace offer, a surrender. Uh, there's a bunch of ships, uh, boats, you know, little wooden boats in this river. And the, uh, the mutineers say, you can get on the boats and sail down river and you can even keep your guns, you can do whatever you want. And so the British accept it. And as soon as they get on the boats, the, the mutineers set them all on fire. And I think about four people escape out of a couple of hundred. And that's the same place where the women and children are killed. Uh, it's, it's not a nice war. And the way the British responded to that was to just be as evil as possible back. And so you get things like, uh, I think it was Moss's troopers or something. But you get basically civilians getting a bunch of horses together and some pistols and just start lynching people randomly. Uh, a lot of them were mutineers, but not all of them were. Um, uh, bushwhacking attacks start happening. The reprisals afterwards, blowing people from guns, uh, massacres of, of Indian settlements and Indian places and, and uh, of Indian women and Indian children. It's not a nice war. And some it, it's, it's not really a civil war, but it's pretty close. And those things are never friendly. Um, the, the amount of reprisals and, and back and forth, tit for tat massacres is pretty nasty. And so the will the scars be healed, do you suppose they can? Uh, that, that What happened in, in India is still a very polarizing thing. Um, Indians, of course, have one particular view of it. The British turn, tend to not have another view on the other side, spe- specifically because the British have this, you know, some people really, really like what the Empire did, some people really, really hate it, but... Generally in India, the uh, the mutineer scene is a just, righteous cause. So, anyway, it's a bit longer than I wanted to talk about that, but the Indian mutiny is very, very um, interesting conflict, and I think that uh, it's not looked at enough, and maybe I'll look at it some more. Very true. Not as much as the Spanish, but still pretty close. As in direct gold. There's a boar there, by the way. I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but there's the one boar. They don't mention them, but uh, there's one there. Just for my third out of the day. So, yes. The artwork is phenomenal. If you just want to look at the artwork, it's worth watching. You can get on mute if you don't like the song. That's a great piece of highlight up there. This is some quick fireworks coming up. Excuse me. I talked over it. Badahov, I've made a video about the song they made about Badahov. Badahov is the brutal siege that ends in... ...which makes Wellesley um, ramp up the provosts. And Badahov is the, the final entry into Spain. People think about this uh, peninsula war, if they do, uh, as a big conflict where the British are just pushing into Spain. But what really happens is they come into Spain and then the French either get around them somehow or there's too many French and they have to retreat into Portugal. And it happens a few times where they come in and out of Portugal and Spain. Uh, but this is the last time. This is Badajov. This is the key to Spain. If they can uh, take Badajov, they can get in. Um, and of course they did. And of course they went all the way to the Pyrenees. So um, it was definitely the key to Spain. Oh, the last stand of the 44th. So you can see, if you can see this officer here, I turned my cursor off, I think, uh, has got a Union Jack around his waist. This is a very famous picture. This is the 44th Regiment of Foot uh, in Afghanistan in, I think, 36, 1836. This is the, um, this is why you don't go to Afghanistan. Uh, it's the middle of winter and it snows. Um, people don't believe that, but it, it snows in Afghanistan. It's very cold. So the British had sent a column under General Elphinstone, one of the most incompetent commanders they had at the time. Um, shouldn't put my opinion in there, but that's what he was. To basically deal with a complex political situation that the military should not be dealing with. Um, they had, the British had deposed uh, the, the Shah of Afghanistan, the, the 
um, Akbar Khan, I think his name was, and uh, uh, the figures like Dost Muhammad are running around this time. This is this is that era, and the British retreat from uh, Kabul. It's the retreat from Kabul is really the nasty part, where basically um, as they're retreating from Kabul down to India, uh, they're just being sniped the entire time. Uh, Afghans with jezails and, and and rifles up in the hills sniping down at them, riding in on horses and attacking the column as it goes along. Um, and the, most, the column is mostly uh, uh, Indian, Indians who don't want to be in Afghanistan or Afghanis who want to go to India, and women and children. Uh, there's, a, there's a good chunk of military there, but most of the column is kind of defenseless and uh, it just gets picked apart. Uh, and repeatedly, the Afghans say, send us hostages and we'll stop. The British do it and they keep going because, of course, they're going to keep going. Uh, Elphinstone himself hands himself over as a hostage at one stage, but he ends up dying in, in captivity. And this is the last stand of the 44th. Um, they got massacred completely. One person made it out of Kabul, I think a doctor, maybe two people. But, you know, we're talking near 10,000 leaving or, or seven or 8,000 leaving, and one person survives. It was, it was brutal. Um, so, yes, the story goes that the... The, uh, well, he, he was, he was, so this is what we know happened. The, the officer put the flag around his waist and then they were massacred. The, yeah, the 44th was completely wiped out uh, in Afghanistan. Ain't Blenheim, spill your blood at the Blenheim. Blenheim is what made John Churchill famous. And uh, if you believe the official story gave us the tank in World War II, the Churchill tank, if you believe it's named after him and not the Prime Minister. Blenheim was a very interesting battle because it's not how you were meant to fight at the time. Churchill was given command of a British force in the Netherlands. Uh, the, uh, this is the War of um, Spanish Succession. I think it's, yeah, Spanish Succession. So 1715. And the Spanish and uh, have the Spanish control the Netherlands. The French want that part of the world. Uh, it's, it's a mess. Uh, essentially, you can, the, the French are trying to put... Um, the heir to the French and Spanish thrones on the Spanish throne, and it's just become a nightmare. Uh, the War of Austrian Succession later would be another issue around this, but basically it's about the, uh, the royal succession of the Spanish throne, and basically the compromise, I believe, was that the, the Bourbons who sat on the Spanish throne and gave up all claim to the French throne but there's debate about whether that was legit today, whether that only applied to the one guy or everybody in the, in the monarchist movements. So anyway, Blenheim was, John Churchill was, was meant to be defending the Netherlands. Austria came under attack. Uh, Vienna came under attack. Um, if Vienna fell, then that would basically, there'd be the end of the war. And the British would be on the losing side because the British were allied with the, the anyway. So what Churchill does is he basically <laughs> pulls off a sneak attack, um, sort of. He convinces the Dutch that he is going to go down to the south of the Netherlands to fortify a bunch of places and to, to do a bit of work down there. Uh, so they give him a whole bunch of supplies and he just leaves. He just leaves and before he gets to every town, he basically sends out envoys. Um, they give him more supplies, but under false pretenses. And he's being shadowed by a French army when this is happening. So it's not like uh, they didn't know he was moving, but... Where was he going? What was he doing? Surely he's not going to try and sneak this giant army up and behind us. And he did. And he won the Battle of Blenheim. And he got a palace. He got Blenheim Palace. He got many, many rewards. And his family became extremely famous. And he's unfortunately... Well, he wouldn't believe it at the time. But he's actually the second most famous Churchill we know of. So that's an interesting, interesting thing to think about. So yes, Blenheim was a early subterfuge effort, which is interesting. Ah, uh, Thin Red Line. So there's three major actions in uh, the Battle of Balaclava, which is in the Crimean War. Uh, three major actions on one day. The Thin Red Line, the Heavy Brigade, and the Light Brigade. The Light Brigade is the most famous. Um, that's where you have... Um, Cardigan leading the Light Brigade into the Russian guns and getting massacred, um, essentially. There's many poems and movies and songs written about the Light Brigade. It's
It was a successful charge that didn't result in complete disaster, so the British, of course, don't remember it. <laughs> the, uh, the British had the habit of remembering their disasters a lot more than their victories. Or, I shouldn't say that, they, they more than most people remember their disasters. And then the thin red line was another incident where um, basically the, the Campbell's thin red line stopped a Cossack charge and they just held their ground and kept shooting. Um, and it's one of the incidents that's often brought, brought up to um, speak about how this is the beginning of where musket fire could just stop um, cavalry. Uh, well, this isn't the beginning, but the, the once once the flintlock musket comes out and you know how to use it properly, um, cavalry charges head on are dead. Um, so yes, it's it's one of those incidences where we're beginning to see the death of cavalry uh, as shock cavalry or or actual charging in the melee head on cavalry in this time period. Oh, this one's great. So Wolf. Uh, this is the, the scaling of the cliffs, which was uh, Captain Cook, who was the British explorer who uh, discovered Australia, or at least mapped the East Coast, um, found a way for them to get up near Quebec, and they climbed, they scaled the cliffs. It wasn't quite that steep. It was probably more like a, a steep hill or some, some tracks and that sort of thing. And Wolfe fought the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, uh, which is a... The Plains of Abraham is one of the most interesting yet least coverable battles in in the French and Indian War. I really should mention when these things happen. This is the French and Indian War. This is the mid part. Um, this battle gives all of Canada to to Britain essentially. Um, the, it's called the Plains of Abraham because a guy named Abraham had a farm, and this is on that farm. Um, it's nothing to do with with Abraham or Isaac or any of those separate guys, but. Wolf has two mountains, or two, I can't, I can't see the screen, so he has two basic areas that he ha can anchor his flanks with, and he puts a, uh, a line of two, two deep all the way between these things, anchoring the flanks. Uh, British doctrine at the time was three deep, and so he's putting two, and so that's where the thin red line comes from. Um, at least one of the possible theories, but I, I tend to believe that one. Um, the British would, in the Peninsula War and later, would stick with two deep as the standard, and it became, yeah, that was actually kind of the best way for them to do it, if you use their tactics and doctrine. Anyway, uh, it wasn't just Redcoats, but he had some Indians and some, oh, sorry, yeah, some, some natives and some, uh, some skirmishers and other types, and uh, uh, light infantry and some, some rangers and that sort of thing, in, in two bits of woods off to the side, and they skirmished with the, um, the Courier de Bois and the, uh, the the French skirmishes, so they basically had their own little battle. One battle here, one battle here, and then the big one in the centre. Uh, it would actually make quite a good war game if you wanted to have three games of, or well, really the middle one isn't really a game, but if you wanted to have two games on the side of sharp practice maybe to find out who's got control of these little woods, because, uh, yeah, okay, the, the, the reason I say the middle one isn't really a game is because it lasts 15 minutes. The whole battle lasts 15 minutes, which means that most videos talking about the battle go longer than the actual battle. And it's impossible to recreate the battle in an accurate time scale on a tabletop because it, once you've got everything on the table, it's about 20 minutes and you're already done. Um, this is, it's a massacre of the French. Um, as they're coming in, British got their thin red line, the French are coming in, the French fire early, um, possibly at the British taunting. Uh, and the British just wait until the French get close and just drill them with musket fire and it's over. Um, the Marquis de Montcalm is killed, who is the French commander, and Wolfe is killed, hence for the final time, Wolfe gets shot uh, and dies. So both the... <laughs> this is what I love about the French and Indian... Uh, tangent within a tangent. I love this about the French Indian War, is that the commanders are getting knocked left and right, and yet people will still say this period was the period of the, of the gentleman soldier who sent other people to die. I mean, they're getting knocked all the time. Um, I'm not going to go through a list, but you look at this period and it's like, this person is in command of this force. And then third, second, maybe the fifth battle they're in is killed <laughs> or is severely wounded. Um, and so, yeah, both commanders are killed in an action that lasts less than 15 minutes. Wolf had a, had a great habit of wearing just a normal uh, soldier's tunic or, or something like that. You can see miniatures of Wolf. I'll put one on the screen. This is from Warlord Games. Um, often depict him as... You know, he was a very 
interesting gentlemen in a good way ah rocks drift i don't need to talk about rocks drift most people know about rocks drift um uh, it was a 24th regiment b company 24th regiment i think it was and a few others defending rocks drift hospital station against the uh, zulus in 79 this refers to the I missed this the first time I heard it, the first few times, but this refers to a statue of the British Grenadiers in the UK. I'll put a picture of it up. Um, it's a statue of the British Grenadiers uh, in the Crimea. So the, the Crimea is sort of, not, whenever you see it, you can sort of pick it out because of the great coats and the, and the fur, uh, and the, the fur, I've forgotten the name for them now, uh, bear skins. Uh, that's pretty standard British, British wear in the Crimea. Uh, beards were encouraged. Um, for really the first time so it's a very interesting look we go from the uh, the color of the Napoleonic Wars to gray great coats British in bear skins with big beards so it's an it's a interesting conflict and uh, one to study if you are into military logistics about the artwork. The artwork is beautiful. It's obviously not commissioned by them specifically, but they collect it from people out there. And I'll leave it there with a picture of, of course, very fitting for, for this, a picture of a British infantryman dressed for the um, Zulu War and the Boer War, the first Anglo-Boer War there. So, thank you very much for watching. This has been uh, Fallen Hope Redcoat. Go and go and sub to their channel, and they're a great band. Um, this is one of their, I think it's their second single they've released after To the Bitter End. Um, if you liked the Fallen Hope, check them out. If you like this sort of video, I've got a whole video breaking down almost every song from their original album. Um, I have to do Master Strike. But I'll get on to that. That one's about these, the Battle of Salamanca. Very interesting. So thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day.